Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Boy, I hate to stagger across there and fall flat on my face before I said anything. <laughs> my name is Gene, and I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I wasn't too anonymous when I was drinking, uh, and I'm not too anonymous sober. My name is Gene. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and uh, I'm real happy to be here for a lot of reasons. Uh, I owe a lot of my growth in this program to you people here in Mississippi. <laughs> in spite of everything I've done, I've stayed sober and prospered. Uh, and I see a lot of people here I love. I'm kind of like... Uh, our state delegate here, uh, Tyson, he, he has a bird dog. Uh, Tyson didn't tell me this, but I understand the dog don't know his name, but he just recognizes faces. See? And that's about the way I am. If I shinny up to you and wiggle my tail and smile, <laughs> uh, what I'm trying to say is I know your face, but I can't remember your name. <laughs> you know, it's real nice to be down here. I went to call the Gold Coast. Now, uh, uh, the last time I was here uh, was just prior to one of the elections as to whether or not they're going wet or dry, I guess. And we were in one of the saloons. You know, you can still eat and watch the girls' go-go shows and all these things without drinking. And a couple of drunks were sitting at the table next to us, and they were talking about this uh, referendum coming up on the ballot uh, about going wet or dry. And one turned to the other and he said, what do you think? And he said, I don't know. Does it affect the gambling? <laughs> Uh, and the Gulf Coast hasn't changed, and I'm happy. Now, the book Alcoholics Anonymous tells me to tell you a little bit about what I used to be like. And like Jerry said, uh, <laughs> uh, I tried everything, proving I was different. I often uh, say of myself that in my pursuit of living with alcohol, I had become everything but a wife and a mother. <laughs> Had medical science at that time figured out an answer prior to Christine, I might have made it. <laughs> and I'm glad for what I found in this program. I, I have no disrespect and I criticize no one for how they say it. Uh, I often say uh, I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and in sense, everything I have I owe to this program. Uh, I recognize, too, that getting sober is not enough. Hell, anyway, <laughs> uh, anybody can stop drinking for a period of time. But uh, with me, it was finding something better. And Alcoholics Anonymous was not a substitute for me. His substitute just didn't do it. You know, I get a little jealous when I hear people, uh, particularly the old-timers, talk about the good old days. Uh, the fellows like Jerry that knew uh, Dr. Bob. And talk about how it was way back then when, you know, I am as much as responsible for this program of being started as Bob and Bill. Because I took my first drink of any type of alcoholic beverage in 1934. And I think this partner I have found in my life is God that we've come to know. Looked out from his perch someplace in the heavens and said, my word, my word, what's happened here? And he threw out a flash trying to straighten me out. And it missed. I was on the West Coast, and it landed in the East Coast and hit uh, Bill Wilson where it would do some good. And Bill did something about his drinking. And in 1935, at a racetrack early in the morning, I took hard liquor. And I thought everybody drank at 4 o'clock in the morning. And again, this higher power <laughs> looked out and saw me through another flash. He got closer. This time it landed in Ohio. You see? And he threw many, many thousands of these flashes across the heavens trying to reach me, I'm sure. These flashes are answers to people's prayers, as I have come to know it. <laughs> many, many people prayed for me from that day on, prayed for my coming aware of what I was doing to myself, and then uh, developing an awareness of what I was doing to other people. And then when other people no longer had anything do, to do with me, an awareness as to what I had done to myself. And, you know, all the time, I knew the difference of right and wrong. See, but once I drank, I didn't care. I came to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous 
almost 20 years ago. I had heard of this program laying in a bed uh, 27 years ago. My aunt read me a story she had written about Alcoholics Anonymous for one of the major newspapers in California. And we commented about it, and I said, yes, Margie, if this ever happens to me, I said, it won't happen to me. I said, but should something ever happen to me as happened to these people, I think this might work, but it's real wonderful that these derelicts have got an answer to the problem, and they can get together. And inside my heart, I'm saying it's a good thing the derelicts are getting together. Maybe we can get them off the street. <laughs> and I said, this would never happen to me, and I meant it. I had a telephone call one day from a brother. He had just been released from a hospital, and he said, my doctor says there's nothing else he can do for me or to me, and I'm sure with me. But he recommended some people in the city of Los Angeles, and he wants me to go down and talk to him. He said, would you drive me? And this was about 19 years ago now, and I drove him to this place, and we went upstairs to the mezzanine floor of this hotel, and I walked into my first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And when I found out that this was a bunch of drunks talking about their lives and drinking and all these things, and I looked around the room to these uh, people who were just one step removed from Skid Row, I thought, my God, to think a brother of mine has to come to people like this for help. You see, he had a suit and a shirt on, and I had a suit and a shirt on. And I don't think anyone else in the room did, because this is all I looked for. I didn't see any of the things that I thought were uh, proper for he or I to be with, and uh, I couldn't possibly imagine him getting any help. I certainly didn't open my ears to a word that was said. He he went to a few meetings, and one day I got a call, it wasn't too many months after this, and I met him at my mother's home, and he was sick. He was terribly sick. He laid on the sofa, and I sat on the sofa with him, and I put his head in my lap, and he looked up at me, and he said, Kid, you better believe these people at these meetings. They've got an answer for you, not for me. And he died an alcoholic, and he died the death of a sick, suffering alcoholic. And I saw most of this death, and yet I turned my back on what he was trying to tell me, and I turned my back on what little knowledge I had of Alcoholics Anonymous, and particularly I turned my back on the disease of alcoholism. I said, I'm different. <laughs> and I damn near died proving it. <laughs> i never forget my, my first experience with our one of our co-founders, Bill Wilson. I worked uh, under a fellow named Bill Wilson with General Motors. This is after I'd already been thrown out of the university in medicine. And I, they had forced me to leave the university in business. Thank God to the... Uh, GI Bill of Rights, I had enough points to get some kind of an education. I got it in spite of all my efforts not to have an education. And rather than graduate me, they give me a license to go out into the business world. And I worked for this fellow, and he had a drinking problem. I knew he had a drinking problem because when he came in with a hangover, he took it out on people like me. And uh, having associated with this program on and off, backing in, backing out, you see, I was at a meeting, and they said, you ought to be sure to come next week. A fellow named Bill Wilson, one of the founders of our program, is going to speak. And he's a revelation. And I'm thinking of the only Bill Wilson I know of that's had a drinking problem with the guy that I work for. And I wanted to see him, and I went to this meeting. I sat at the end of a table, and there was a tall, uh, rather a lanky fellow. But he had, a, he had a soft complexion. He had a sparkle in his eyes. And he got up when they introduced Bill Wilson, and I thought, well, this isn't the guy I know. And I almost completely disregarded everything he said. But, you know, I was mystified and I was enchanted by his smile and this twinkle in his eye. And I forgot about this. I forgot everything he said. I was more impressed with the fact a fellow named Chuck had four years of sobriety. He was speaking the following week. And I thought I could get a job from Chuck. See, uh, I didn't hear Chuck and I didn't get a job. I lost many a job, though, and I lost everything I tried to hold on to, proving I was different. I had gotten married. Matter of fact, I had gotten married several times, really. <laughs> when did alcoholism set in on me? I don't know, but I was engaged to a very fine woman. I had gone with her for quite some time, knew her all the way through school, and during this engagement, I married another woman. Uh, drinking. And trying to make a success of this marriage for six months, and it was pure hell for both of us because we had no communication, no understanding. Without our drinking every evening and every weekend, we had nothing in common. The day came when she sobered up, 
and shook her head, and she said, I can't take any more of this. Whatever started, got to stop. And she threw me out. I went back to the other woman. It's fantastic when I see Alamon women, how they will stick with a loser like us. I think we were blessed with some of the greatest women that God ever put on the earth when they'll sit and put up with people like us who abuse them, misuse them, punish them, cheat, lie, and do everything destructive to a woman, and yet they continue to put their arms around us when we stagger home. Well, this woman that I had been engaged to, I did marry, uh, and she was the mother of my daughters. And I thought for a period of time that I had begun to find my place in society. Uh, but yet, uh, uh, alcohol kept calling me back. This enchanting lure of what one drink can do. When I was tired, a drink of alcohol would refresh me. When I was all keyed up, a drink of alcohol would slow me down. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going up and down like a yo-yo. <laughs> it's small wonder I never had any good sense, you see. But, you know, this woman began uh, to become a little suspicious of my activities. You know, the first time you don't come home at all, they kind of understand your excuses. At least they don't say too much. And when you lose a job and tell them, well, I just couldn't work for this guy anymore, I had to quit. And, and they try to be compassionate and understanding, but, you know... After so many jobs and so many nights out, they become suspicious of something. And they, they begin this program of interrogation. Like, where were you last night? Uh, what happened to this job? Where is the car? Uh, I waited at the beauty shop for five hours. What happened? Uh, one morning, uh, I staggered in on my hands and knees. Really, I was shaky even on all fours. This woman asked me a question I had the answer for. It was the only time she asked me a question that I had an answer for. She says, why do you come home at all? See, and I knew why I came home, because I had no place else to go. And this was the only reason I went home. These people that I had heard periodically in Alcoholics Anonymous, and particularly the fellows who tried to sponsor me, threw the book in my face, and they said, read this. The one thing they did do to me, they made me buy a book. Uh, I had money in my pocket, and they took it out of my pocket and bought a book and gave me the change and said, read it. See? Uh, and I'm glad they did. I still carry that book with me. It's in my room upstairs, a book that was purchased in 1942, and it was only the last eight years that it's had any use. But, you know, I heard all these things, and they said, if you keep on drinking, the things we're talking about will happen to you. And, you know, I used to come up with these excuses. Well, I'm not really an alcoholic. Yeah, I've got some of your symptoms, but if I could only get the pressure off my back, if I could only get the creditors to leave me alone until I had a full month's pay, <laughs> I'd go to the bank and borrow $400 to straighten out all my creditors, and I'd figure out, well, if I get 400 I'd get four and a half just in case of an emergency, you see, and I'd go pay the first bill, and I thought, boy, that guy had $70 out of that four, I better go have a drink and figure out who to see next, you see. And pretty soon I haven't got any of the money left, and I've still got all the creditors, you see. And the job, all these things, you see. They said it would happen, and I laughed at them. Well, one by one, Chuck C. from Long, uh, Laguna Beach sat me down one day, and he said, Gee, I'll put a picture right on the wall here. He was in my home. He said, if I could have a piece of Korean, I would mark right here at the bottom where you're at right now, and I'll put a graph across this room, and so help me God, in five years you will fulfill everything I have written down here and worse. I didn't say anything to Chuck, but when he got out there, I said, I'll show him, and I'll show everybody else. Whatever is bugging me, I'll take care of myself. <laughs> Chuck says if he was 2% smarter, he'd have died drunk. If I if I had stayed just as smart as I was that day, I would have died drunk ten years ago. Because everything happened. I had to lose this family. You see, I sold everything out. Everything had a price. One drink. They told me. People who tried to help me say, all right, how much is your wife worth? And I was thinking of in dollars and cents because she was working. Okay? <laughs> I sold her out for a drink. My home, a business. And finally, what little self-respect I had. And, you know, I clung to a thing called dignity. I'm the kind of a drunk, you know. 
after being down on Skid Row four days. Uh, you know, you don't exactly get rooms with masks and all these things. I wear white shirts. I love white shirts. Uh, and when I was drinking, I loved white shirts. And sometimes you get awful dirty and I'd get to a restroom, preferably in a service station that had borax in those cans. And I'd wash the collar and sometimes I'd turn the shirt inside out. Then get to a bar that was just a little darker so no one would recognize it. And after one of these ventures down on uh, 4th and San Pedro there in Los Angeles, I went back to a bar that I had drank at and that I had cashed a few checks and some of the checks had failed to clear the bank. <laughs> I think it's because I didn't have an account in the bank, but I'm not sure he did. <laughs> and I asked this fellow, I said, look, would you cash your checks so I can get back on my feet? And he said, Gene, I'll give you $5 if you go someplace else and drink. <laughs> and so I took his $5 and I went down the street and, you know, it finally happened. Everything happened. Anything that was important to me in life, I got rid of. Why? See, I still don't know. I still don't know why I had to have a drink more than I wanted to hold on to the things that were important. I came to this program for my wife, for my boss, for the chief of police, for the bankers, for the credit association, for anything and everybody. And I found myself short of what it is you had to offer. Until the day came when I walked into AA and I came to believe, I came to find an answer. Now, there is one period of my life I'm not going to go too deep in tonight. Uh, a lot of you know it. But you see, I'm on trial tonight. It's kind of like being up the bank the other day. I cashed a check and I had a handful of money. A lot of small bills, but it was all mine. It was legal. And one of the clerks had tripped the burglar alarm or the whatever they call it. <laughs> and I have never seen so many cops in my life. They just swarmed all over that bank. And for a minute, I panicked. All the air went out of my lungs in the room. My head began to swell. And you know, you know how it is when you turn to the wall real quick, you know? But then again, the uh, composure set in, and I, I didn't even have to use a serenity prayer. I said, hell, this ain't me. <laughs> uh, they came in, they found out it was a mistake, and uh, they let me out. And when I walked out the door, this man in the business suit said, I'm awfully sorry you were detained, Mr. Clement. I said, that's all right. <laughs> he don't know how all right it was. But you know, at our convention last year, I think I was on trial, too. After losing all these things, God found out when I was ready to have what I needed. And he, he gave me the thing that was most important in my life. Aside from my relationship with him, the fellow I call my partner in this business a living, and aside from my association with you, who are my bloodline to living, he found a person that I could share my life with and my experiences, and my strength, and my hope. And right after the convention, uh, when I didn't get run out of town for shooting off my mouth about how good it was going to be and all, all these things, you know, uh, I got a wife. And a lot of you know Margaret. And this has been the greatest blessing of my life. And tonight, uh, I think God found fit to let me borrow two children that I could share part of my life with, too. And this is the first time they've heard me talk, and you can bet your badges I'm not telling everything tonight. <laughs> For several reasons. One is if they like anything at all they hear, they might come back. And if they don't like it, I don't want to tell them all anyway, you see. But I, I'm real happy that I have this privilege to see to share life with people. People who understand me just a little bit. But more important, people with whom I can communicate. Because the day came when I was in... I want you to listen to this word now. I found myself in a state-supported institution. <laughs> Adds a little class to it, daughter. They told me I'd never, I could go to a nut house if I kept on drinking, and I found myself there. They even talked about these poor old guys going out their melons and DT and being the straight jacket, and I said, never. <laughs> I don't know how many times I found myself in a straitjacket, but I tell you, I find out how to get comfortable in one of them. <laughs> Most important thing is you don't resist. <laughs> well, I happened to be in this institution, and I had been in many institutions. 
jails and hospitals and derelict uh, rooming houses, skid rows and bridges. These things are no new experience for the alcoholic who has to prove to himself he's different. See? Yeah. If you got the willpower to keep on buying the stuff and to keep on fighting to get it, so you, you can eventually experience all these experiences. But I was in this meeting. Uh, I was uh, forced to attend the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because the psychiatrist who was working on me said what he needs is a program of therapy similar to that of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I lit up like this was brand new. See? Here I, I am known as a professional newcomer in Southern California. <laughs> uh, in the greater Los Angeles area today, there are better than 700 meetings you can go to in any week. Uh, back then, I think there was about 417, and I had belonged to about 392 of them. <laughs> I like walking in for the first time to a group and standing up and saying, My name is Gene, and I think I've got the same problem you have. You know, they applaud, and they come pat you on the back, and they tell you all the good news. And I was looking around to find out which one I could put the bite on for $10 and tell them the hard luck story, maybe get a job, and at least get a decent meal while some guy is going to bend my ear on how this thing works. <laughs> and in spite of all my efforts not to make it, see, something happened. It was at a meeting one night, a mixed meeting. This woman talked, her name was Peggy Fleming. I like to tell this about Peggy, and Pe Peggy doesn't object. She talked about finding God. See, really, this is what this program is all about. This is a spiritual program. It says so in the book. It tells us in the book that this program enables us to find a God we can live with. And Bill Wilson says in the closing paragraph of his story that without having a complete psychic change, we have no possibility of success in this business of living. This is the spiritual thing I'm speaking of. This is a thing I had never sought out. I had never looked for God of any kind, yours or mine or anybody else's. And besides, you know, when you're in a nut house or when you're down at the city jail and you know your family only lives four or five blocks up the street, or you're in any institution, it's awfully hard to get down on your knees with these other guys, these other inmates looking at you and telling God, this time I mean it. And I wasn't able to. I didn't have the guts to tell God this time I mean it. But Peggy told her story, and she talked about surrendering to God. as a, She understood God, and after the meeting, Peggy had stressed time and time again to keep it simple. And after the meeting, I, of course, I was real smart anyway, and I wanted to get all the little details about it so I could really jazz up this simple bit and really get it. And she told me, she said, it's just from inside your heart. This is the only way, and you have to be sincere. You have to want to accept the help that you're going to get if you ask God. And so after this meeting, I had an occasion to sit out on this rock, and I looked up into the heavens, and I said, well, God, I guess it's between me and you now. And I prepared myself for this surrender. Uh, and honestly, I expected the heavens to light up and a ray of light to shine down from as far out in space as you could see right onto me. And I expected the entire valley below uh, this camp I was in to radiate and they would come from miles to find out what this miracle was. You see, and God don't buy this sort of thing. And I thought when there no light appeared that perhaps I would see a flicker in the bushes of a... If a firefly had only passed by, I would have been willing to accept that, see? But I had no flicker, and there was no small voices except that little voice inside me that says, Go on back inside, you stupid fool. It's cold out here. <laughs> and I sat back inside, and I was sitting on the edge of my little bed and smoking a cigarette, and actually I was a little disgusted about this thing, and something Peggy said about keep it simple. God don't want to buy all this baloney. I said, God, if you can accept me knowing what you do about me, I give up. This is a while back now. See, a lot of people had been putting these white flashes into the heavens, and God had been sending white flashes back. These were the prayers of other people. I don't suppose God really answered my prayer for quite a while. But God began to answer the prayers of people who cared about me, people whom I had suspected and accused of not loving me anymore. People who no longer cared about me because I had this disease. And 
Uh, in fact, I used this disease as an excuse many, many times in my favorite bars. And a bartender come in and say, Gene, you got awful drunk last night. How about cooling it tonight? You know, have a couple and go home early. And, and I would give him this pleading look, and I'd say, Barney, I, I've got to tell you something. I found out I, I've got this disease. It's alcoholism. And I can't control myself sometimes. So if I get out of line, just kind of go along with me, and uh, whatever it is, I'll straighten out tomorrow. See, this got me just a little simply, but it got me credit, too, see. And these are the ways I had used all these things, and yet this, this time these prayers were answered. And uh, something happened with inside me. I don't know what it is. Nothing happened the next day. Uh, well, if you, you like a sign, I'll tell you this, my sinus is cleared up. I wasn't aware of that for two or three days until the fellow that I worked with in the camp office said, Gene, what'd you take for your sinus? And I said, nothing. He said, well, they seem to be dry. Right there, I said, God has answered my prayer. See, this is a sign. See, I think he has to be kind of desperate when you accept anything for a sign. See? I think I was desperate. But, you know, I start turning my life over to God a little at a time as best I could under this situation. I had to hurt a lot, and I had to stay inside a lot, too. I had to belong to other people for quite a while. But the day came when I could belong to me. I'll never forget the first meeting I went to once I was back outside. So my a friend of mine named O.B. took me to this meeting. He introduced me as a newcomer. And I stood up and turned around, and he said his name is Gene, and everybody applauded, and I liked this applause a little bit. He said, but there's one other thing. He said, I think you ought to know something else about it. And he started telling him where I'd been and what I'd done. I wanted to hit this guy right in the mouth, and I wanted to jump right out of that building right then and there, you know. What's this guy doing breaking my uh, anonymity right here? But, you know, these people came up to me, and they put their arms around me, and they said, look, if you're an alcoholic or drinking is your problem and you want to do something about it, you don't ever have to drink again. And if you don't like being in jails and hospitals and running up and down the alleys trying to find out who you are and what you are, you don't have to. See, we've got an answer for people just like you if you can only sit still long enough to listen. And, and you know, under my present situation, I didn't have too much choice. I had no place else to go. I had used up everything else. I stuck around these people, and, you know, things did get better. And I can look back now on just about seven years, and things got real good. But, you know, it did all happen just at once. Uh, I didn't uh, find it easy to get a job. Now, here, this dandy is back out in the society uh, uh, with one suit, one pair of shoes, and one complete wardrobe was all I had. You know, it's awful hard to make an impression on people. Wearing the same suit and a shirt and tie four days in a row when you're looking for a job. Oh, I had some uh, dungarees or something, but, you know, you don't look for these top executive jobs in dungarees. <laughs> Finally, I got just the job I was looking for. <laughs> the job I was looking for actually was any job with a check. <laughs> but I went into this man and uh, signed his questionnaire. It was for manual labor is what it was. And uh, on there, it says, have you ever been arrested, you ever been addicted, and all these things. And I put a great big question mark, and I said, I can't answer this. I'd like to talk to the personnel manager. And I suppose I had a desperation on my face. At least my eyes seemed to shine or something and radiate fire. Because this woman didn't know what kind of nuts she had in her hand. She got the personnel manager. And all they called me in his office is, why can't you fill this out? And I said, well, uh, you got a few minutes? And he said, yeah. I didn't call him Wally, I called him Mr. Something, whatever it was. And I told him a little bit about me, and every time I uh, expounded on another episode, his mouth got just a little wider. And then his eyes began to get just a little wider, and after a while, perspiration come down the side of his face. Finally, put his hands up and says, my God, don't tell me another thing. Where do you want to work? <laughs> and he put me to work out in his factory, and I boxed plastic rolls, and these things weighed 150 to 200 pounds, and you know when uh, you've been kept in confinement, you're not getting your proper exercise, and you're not physically the way you think you ought to be, this is not easy. But you know, these people in AA said it isn't designed to be easy. It's simple. 
You acted simple, you think simple, and your results have been simple. Now, why can't you just let this be simple and listen? And when I got off of work, one of them was there to pick me up. And they took me back to this little place I was staying for a while. But they made sure I changed clothes if I had a change of clothes. And if not, they took me as is, and they took me to a meeting. And I was fortunate in a way I was blessed with the opportunity because... In this area, they had meetings that begin at 8 o'clock in the morning for working people, the swing shift and the graveyard shift. And every two hours around the clock in the metropolitan Los Angeles area, you can go to a meeting. And when I wasn't working, they had me at a meeting. And, you know, uh, making about $54 a week take-home pay, you can't afford to do an awful lot. And I'd get to a lot of meetings at noontime, and bless these women. Oh, bless these women in AA. They would come there during their noon hour for part of the meeting, and they would bring sandwiches to eat. And they would look at me, and suddenly they'd say, Look, Gene, how about a sandwich? Uh, I can't eat anymore. And I'm like these little squirrels out here under the trees, you know. They would like to come to your hand and eat the nuts, but they don't really trust you. They want to know what your gimmick is. But if you throw the nuts to them, they'll grab them and run back to the trees. Well, when these gals wasn't looking, I'd grab their sandwich, and I'd run into the... And you see, you placed a responsibility on me. I found out it doesn't take much of a man or woman to make this program, but it does take every bit of them. I, I like to refer to alcoholics like me in particular, a little bit to this slave Onesimus in the Bible. Now, our dear friend Fulton Hausler wrote about it in The Greatest Faith Ever Known. Onesimus had heard the message at his master's home. Onesimus also stood in the back of the crowd, and he only paid attention to what he wanted to hear about this way of life. The speaker came and left. The crowd dispersed, and an opportunity came up for Onesimus to steal all the gold out of his master's house, and he did. And he took off to Rome, and he spent it, I suppose, just like an alcoholic would spend it, you know, on wine, music, and chasing women, or whatever they chase back there. <laughs> but he ended up where I would have ended up, right in the dump, see? And he was sick, and he had remorse and regrets, shaking and all these things, you know. He managed to get back in town. He had heard that this speaker was in Rome. And he made his way up to this place, and Paul opened the door and took him in. He did the very thing that I am supposed to do today. He took an isthmus in and cleaned him up, gave him a bath, put a change of clothes on his back and put warm food inside. And then he said, an isthmus, where do you want to go? This is a responsibility I have to the new alcoholic. I've got to clean him up, you know, get him off the booze. I've got to feed him with his spiritual knowledge. And if necessary, I have got to put a clean change of clothes on his back. It tells me in the book, we open our hearts, our love, our homes, and sometimes our money where necessary to help the individual. But this is what Paul did. And when Onesimus had been cleaned and had been warmed, he says, where do you want to go? And this is back to my master to make amends. See? And Paul wrote this epistle. Oh, he said several things about it. You know, Paul had a little sense of humor there. And he said, this guy had been of no value to you in the past. Typical of an alcoholic. We hadn't been valuable to anybody when we drank. But he said that it had been necessary for Onesimus to be gone a little while that he might return forever. This is the alcoholic. We had to leave everything that we tried to hold on to. Our very homes, our families, our jobs, our life, our environment. We had to leave it into this mad, mad world of alcoholism, trying to prove somehow, someday, we could control and enjoy our drinking like our fellow man. We forgot to remember that we're dealing with alcohol. It's cunning, baffling, powerful, and patient. There's a drink waiting for every person in this room tonight. But thank God with the knowledge you have with sobriety and freedom of choice, you and you alone decide whether or not you're going to take that drink. Oh, it'll wait. If there's any doubt in your mind, I, I hate to do this, but I tell you if there's any doubt in your mind, go read the book. Take chapter 3 apart. Analyze it to the best of your ability. Then go back and try to drink if you can, you know you can. Not you alcoholics. I could never do it. 
I have yet to meet an alcoholic who has successfully gone back to drinking without ruining the rest of his life. Really, there are two types of people who find success with us in Alcoholics Anonymous. One is the man or woman who comes to know the nature of his disease and can do something about it before he's destroyed everything. And the other is the alcoholic who's got to prove, he's got to fight right down to the last, that he's different. And then when there's no place else to go, when there's absolutely no place else to go, what a paradox, you know. In this downward climb, as fast as we can make it, we go to the church, you know, it's awful hard to go to church because you've got to clean up a little bit. But I have yet to see an alcoholic walk down the aisle and turn around to the congregation and says, My God, help me. Something's wrong. I need your help. If you have this private consultation or conversation with your pastor, undoubtedly he's going to give you the advice the best he knows how. But you see, we have deceived this man, all these men in the church. And they don't know what to believe with us anymore. You know, they're going to pray for us. They're going to offer prayers and love. and They're going to try to understand us, but we make it impossible. And we have gone to the doctor. And boy, the doctors, they still, with all the knowledge they have today, continue to shake their heads about us alcoholics. Because, you see, we go in and diagnose ourselves. We lie about the very disease that's killing us in order to get the kind of treatment we think we ought to have. And we do the same thing with the psychiatrist, you know. Uh, we so sell ourselves a bill of goods that we have no differential between truth and fiction. And yet, uh, all these agencies that try to help us have got to turn their head and just shake it and say, I can't understand you. And the worse you are when you walk into Alcoholics Anonymous, the greater your chances of recovery. You talk about a paradox, you see. And this is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Bring us your weak and your suffering, and we'll patch them up, and we'll make men and women out of them, and we'll surprise the world, and we do. I don't say that we alcoholics are God's chosen people, but I think we've been blessed with a certain something, a type of love and compassion, this understanding, this empathy that goes beyond normal understanding or knowledge, that when we make our 12-step call in the sick alcoholic we can sit there with a smile on our mouth and a sparkle in our eye and hurt right with him and yet say, yes, I know. And the alcoholic who is still drinking can't understand how we can be so damn smart about him or her. See, only by living it ourselves. I think, too, we're, we're guilty, about 75% of us in Alcoholics Anonymous, when we make 12-step calls, that we're making calls we're not qualified to make. See, it, it, it's pathetic, the amount of members we have, not right in this state or this room, but in, in Alcoholics Anonymous the world over, who haven't gone to any lengths to get this program, you know, the length I'm speaking of is buying the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and reading about this fellowship. The book, AA Comes of Age, is a treasure about the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous, and yet... We are afraid to spend the money to buy it. I don't think alcoholics get real tight when they sober up. I think, in truth, most of them are trying to face reality and pay their bills, and they find out if they pay their bills, they haven't got any money left. <laughs> I like to believe that. See? But I'm happy for what I have today. God has been very kind to me. I had abused God, and I had abused His program. The people I thought no longer loved me, I have come to find did love me. But I had made it completely impossible for these people to communicate with me. When I was ready, God gave me everything I've needed. I don't have to pray for all these things uh, the way I used to pray. This morning I asked God that His will be done. During our afternoon walk along the beach, I had moments of meditation to be grateful that I'm who I am and that I'm where I am. And when I look at Margaret and her children and know that God has given me an opportunity to share some of my hope and my love with them, I'm indeed grateful, you see. I owe you all the gratitude I can possibly muster up. You who represent the, the life and the body of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a lot of fun in AA. You know I have a lot of fun in AA. 
When I go to bed at night, I am no longer afraid to look in the mirror. I like to look for that sparkle. I've got it in my eyes because God put it there. You showed me how to find God, and you showed me how to keep my communication open with him. I'm glad what I see. As long as I can put my head in that pillow at night and say, thank you, God, for what you gave me today, I haven't got a problem. I am a living success in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Once I had a drinking problem, I don't have a drinking problem tonight. I don't really have a living problem tonight. I have a little thing going between me and my higher power, a fellow I choose to call God. I love the way Gert says it. A real lovely young man entered her life. Uh, he may or may not have been the son of God, but he was the closest thing she has come to, uh, to understand is God. Well, well, whatever it is, I'm glad I can feel it inside. See, and I can share it with people just like you. Like I said, I have a lot of fun in AA. I hope I don't ever offend anybody. I don't mind getting people mad because if you get mad, you start thinking about this program. But I want to caution you and beg you tonight before you go to bed to think of the alcoholics right in this immediate area or in this state or in your hometown or your state. Think of the alcoholics who are still dying with this disease of Alcoholics Anonymous and haven't had the opportunity to hear about us and God. See? It takes both. And I want to remember that there's a lot of people who have heard about us but just haven't managed to get back. And I have to offer a prayer for them, and I hope you do too. But, you know, uh, my closing statement has never changed, I don't suppose. And all the fun you've afforded me to have in this program of Alcoholics Anonymous and all the opportunities I've had to talk about AA, I find that people still stay sober in spite of everything I tell them. And I know uh, right now I've finally got it up to four people who are staying sober just to spite me. But, you know, I, I'm going to thank God tonight, and it's in my prayer. I like to believe that someplace, somehow, someone has stayed sober tonight because of me. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.